So guys, today we're going to be talking about weed reproduction, specifically looking at reproduction via seed and then reproduction via um, vegetative um, propagation. So just a couple examples here. We have some giant foxtail. As we all know that they're summer annuals, they pr reproduce by seed. And then we have on the right hand side some rhizomes from Johnson grass, which is one of our rhizonomous perennials that we were testing on yesterday and on Tuesday. Okay. So just to quote that Tony had here, um, a notable feature of most weeds, especially annual weed species, is their ability to, see, um, to seed without the need of a pollinator. Um, and this can be done either by autogamy, which is self-fertilization, as we all know, or by agamospermy, which is without fertilization. Even when outcrossing does occur, when are generalized flower visitors are generally adequate. So um, this is basically just getting at the idea that a lot of weed species have developed to not require the need of a pollinator vector. They don't need to have you know, a specific insect or animal to help them pollinate. We, they might use them, however, to aid in seed dispersal, which we'll talk about later in the lecture. The advantages of these two mechanisms for weeds include basically starting a seed-produced colony in different areas. So creating through, uh, new colonies through dispersal from a single immigrant, so one single plant, or helping with the regeneration of a colony after, say, some um, you know, catastrophic event has occurred where a lot of species have died off. So two main concepts are uniparental reproduction, which is basically selfing, or by occasional recombination, which can help through genetic crossing or mixing of genes across two multiple plants. Basically, the main concept here is pollination without the use of a vector. So just to give some examples of how some annual weed species reproduce by seed, a lot of these species, um, one of their main um, advantages is the fact that weeds produce thousands and thousands of seeds, so a very high volume, where the seeds have a very small or size to them or overall um, weight. Um, some of the biggest seeds that we have, which are actually still pretty small, are velvet leaf or butylon theophrasti, which is only three millimeters in width. You also have Venus mallow or hibiscus trionum, which is on the bottom there, and that is only 2.1 millimeters. You also have common ragweed and giant ragweed, which are one of our bigger seeds that can range between 4 to 10 or 12 millimeters in width or in size. We also have mare's tail, which is getting a little bit smaller. They range, as you guys saw this week in lab, they're about 1.2 to 2 millimeters in size. Pennsylvania smartweed, which we'll look at in a couple weeks, is one of the bigger seeds that's ranging between about 3 millimeters. Black medic is more on the size of about 2.3 or it can sometimes be the size, it even gets smaller to be about 1.5 because it has a seed husk that aids with water dispersal. Or you can have prickly lettuce, which is about three millimeters in size. Lastly, then some of our smallest seeds that we have include lamb's quarters and cochlea, which range between about one to 1.5 millimeters in size. And then redroot pigweed, which we kind of saw this week in lab, and I think morning glory, which range between one to five millimeters. So really the big concept here is again, um, a lot of volume of seeds, so thousands and thousands of seed that are produced, but at a really, really small size. Why do you think that this might be advantageous for weed species? Anybody? Yeah, Rob. Yeah. Exactly. So use our, it's basically an R strategist idea, getting as many people out and dispersed into the area as possible, not being too concerned as to how many are actually going to survive, because you have so many thousands of seeds out there, your probability of survival is much higher. Stephen, did you have anything you wanted to add to that, or same kind of idea? Yeah, exactly, too. Yep. 
Okay, so this is kind of just getting this graph here or figure or table is getting at the idea of seed production capabilities of certain weed species. So a bunch of our most common weed species here and then, then looking at the total number of seeds per plant as well as what their size is overall. Our biggest one here is mullen with about 200, over 200,000 seeds per plant. It's pretty impressive. Our next one, biggest one, is red root pigweed with over 100,000 seeds per singular plant. And then we also have one of my favorites, lamb's quarters, which is almost 75,000 seeds per plant. Pretty hefty numbers. Okay, so some features of seed production. There are two different types of plants or two different types of seed production that you can have in terms of a life cycle. You can have monocarpic plants or monocarpic seeds where these plants will produce seeds at one point in their life and then they, the parent plant will die off. This is common with a lot of our annual weed species. They'll grow through the one season with a number one goal of producing as many seed as possible and then they're, they'll die off. Some perennials can do this, but it's pretty uncommon. One of the more famous perennials that does this is bamboo. Um, you can also have polycarpic plants or polycarpic seeds where seed is produced repeatedly, so multiple times within its season, either with annual plants or with perennials at irregular um, intervals. So sometimes you can have annual species that will have multiple flushes of seed, or you can have perennials, of course, that could produce seed every year. Um, again, seed size is really important, but it's been obviously compromised over the years by weed species to adapt with getting higher numbers, total numbers of seed. Um, leaving seeds on the seed on the soil surface is also a really good strategy for plants, or for weed plants at least. By releasing these thousands of seeds and by their small size, the relying on the smaller size of the seed to just trickle down through the soil or kind of just fall through the soil instead of having to require some sort of cultivation or turning over of soil or something like that. Um, a lot of IPM strategies currently are working and looking at different types of seed predation. So trying to investigate which insects out there or which diseases are really common with um, infecting seeds before they are able to germinate. And sometimes a lot of other, other researchers are looking at um, the effects of heating or freezing on seeds, trying to look at different you know, environmental conditions, how they can really affect those seeds. So this is an example, basically looking at the different types of reproductive um, patterns in plants. So at this first section here, we have an example A is basically your annual plants. You have a reproductive stage, and then this hump represents the flush of seeds that they would have. Um, B represents a biennial plant, so you have that first year of reproductive growth. The second year has a little bit more of reproductive growth and then that final um, production of seeds in the end. C is one of our examples of a monocarpic perennial. So in case bamboo grows for many, many, many years um, vegetatively and then has that final year of seed production. D is one of our annual fruiting perennials, so things such as you know apples or other you know fruiting structures and stuff like that. E is a masting perennial, whereas F is a perpetual fruiting perennial. So this is a plant that would be constantly flowering, constantly producing seed and stuff like that. Okay, so what are some examples of seed dispersal? First one we have is wind. What are some other examples, guys, that you can think of? How can seeds, just in general, whether they're weeds or regular plants, how can they be dispersed? Stephen? Uh, the yeah, so by animals eating the fruit, so zoorchy, as we would call this. Um, you can have both external zoorchy, where you have, say, um, with burdock or with other seeds that would attach to the fur or, say, you know, pant legs of humans or animals. Or you can have endozoochery, which is where, as Stephen was saying, the fruit has to be ingested by an animal or by a human and then is transferred to a new place through excretion of the animal. What are some other mechanisms of dispersal? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry? Yeah. 
Yep, just basically just falling off of the plant itself. So really simple. Not always the best strategy because you aren't too far away from your parent plant, but this could also help and be related back to wind dispersal. Colin. Yep, you, some weeds and other plants do use water as their main mechanism of dispersal as well. So I think you guys got pretty much all of them. We have wind, water, animals, and then humans. So wind, as we know, a lot of the Asteraceae family plants have, use a pappus or other wind-promoting structures. Um, you can have winged seeds, as in maples, um, or dust-like seed, which is very common with parasitic weeds. Um, Water, or hydrochory, is where the seed has to float. So some seeds might have um, a seed coat that's very much larger than the endosperm that's inside, promoting a lot of airspace, which would help the seed float. Um, then we were talking about zuriki, or animal dispersal, with the endozuchery and exozuchery, and then also humans. But sometimes this doesn't help. We might, um, humans at least, help with both short and with long dispersal of seeds. So just some examples here, guys, of different types of um, structures on, on the seeds that would aid in different types of seed dispersal. So here at the top, we have a bunch of species that would aid in wind dispersal, some others that would aid in animal dispersal here, or also wind, and then, of course, animal dispersal at the bottom with all of the different bracts and just spurs and things that can help attack or attach to animals. Here we've got some other examples of seeds in terms of animal or human dispersal, um, carrying basically or aiding in carrying seeds to new locations. And here we have some examples. Cocklebur is looking at um, human dispersal or animal dispersal. Dandelion, as we all know, dispersed by wind. And then curly dock is one of those examples that is dispersed by water. As you guys can see, there's the seed pod, which is much bigger than the seed which is inside, aiding it in water dispersal. Okay. This diagram here is um, looking at the different patterns of travel through wind. So by traveling either across wind, with the wind patterns, um, or against the wind, and then looking at how far from the original seed source um, those seeds have been carried. Clearly, as everybody can see here, the more successful seed dispersal in terms of distance and in terms of total amount of seed dispersed relates back to traveling with the wind. So traveling in the same direction that the wind is going makes pretty much sense. Whereas the least amount of seed that's dispersed and least successful here is across the wind which kind of is kind of interesting because one, I almost would think that it would go, Stephen, go ahead. I imagine it's probably going in opposite directions or diagonally across the wind from, okay, so say if, say if your wind is traveling in, in this direction from south to north, okay? And you can have across the wind by the seed traveling from a southwest direction to northeast, or you can have it from southeast to northwest or even in the opposite direction as well. So I think that is what the two across the wind patterns are looking at. I w well, yeah, so one, you can have going basically within the same direction of the wind, except you're traveling across the pattern. This is probably the one that is represented by the plus sign, whereas you can have it coming in an opposite direction, so against the wind, but also across, going in a northwest to southeast direction, which would be more probable to the X. Yeah. So. Okay. This figure here is looking at um, just basically different viability, uh, viable seeds that after they have been passed through animal digestive tracts and which ones um, or which at least weed species seem to be most adaptive to being ingested by different plants. So here we can see that um, field bindweed seems to be one of the more popular or just adapted plants here 
having been eaten by calves or by pigs, as well as um, sweet clover and Virginia pepperweed. So these are ones that you're going to be finding pretty common in different livestock areas, and they've adapted to growing in areas where livestock is, livestock is present so that they can be eaten and still be viable after having been ingested. Okay, one other figure before we move on. So dispersal is really important, or an important mechanism when it comes to seeds. And one of the number one strategies of what weeds want to do is not only produce as many seeds as possible, but create mechanisms through dispersal so that they can get to new colonies or create new colonies and get to new areas. Basically, dispersal happens on two different scales, a scale of time and then a scale of space. Here we can see in looking at this graph, you can see that when you have a higher probability of the number of seeds that you have, so when you have greater numbers of seeds produced, and then looking at a scale of distance or a temporal, or not temporal, but spatial scale, you'll see that it's, you have a better dispersal rates when you're, when you have better, when you have higher production of your seed. Um, higher numbers also lead to an increased probability of survival, which is here seen by the increase or the increasing curve up here. So when you have higher numbers of seed produced, you're assuming that the number of seed that is going to end up surviving relative to the distance is going to be higher because you have that more seed or you have that bigger volume of seed. Where, these, where the dispersal curve and the probability of survival curve cross is the point in, or the distance at which is most probable for you to get recruitment of new genes. Or basically, it's the area where you're most probable to be colonizing. So this is where, at this certain distance here, depending upon the species, is most probably where you're going to have the greatest number of new colonies be established as well as the most pro higher probability of you gaining new genes from other plants or just other um, members of your population of the same species. Does that kind of make sense to people? So instead of um, crossing with your neighbors, because you have established new colonies and new areas, that's going to help you maintain your weedy um, nature by spreading. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? It's kind of confusing at first. but. Makes sense after you look at it after a while. Okay, there are two main dispersal strategies of weeds versus the phalanx um, expansion and then there's gorilla expansion. Looking first at phalanx, um, this is common in quackgrass and in Canada thistle. And you basically, you have from your original colony, your colony just moves as force as a wall. So here if we were looking at the green bar being our quackgrass or our Canada thistle, and then our yellow dots here being our field or a new area of colonization. Basically, your phalanx expansion is just going to occur and move to the new area. With gorilla expansion, such as purple loosestrife or many clonal species, you have the development of new satellite groups that appear in areas different from your original colony. And then these satellite groups that have developed, well, sorry. We'll move closer back to the original colony, basically infecting the areas that were not previously infected. Any questions there? Or any experiences of you guys seen this at all in your fields or something like that? Okay. So now moving on to vegetative reproduction. There are basically two different types of vegetative reproduction or areas of reproduction. Um, you have a gannet, which is a genetically distinct individual. So each singular plant, which is in, described as an individual, developing basically from seed or can be a seed, is described as a gannet. Um, a ramet is a single unit of a clonal growth. So a ramet develops from a gannet. Does that kind of make sense? By means of reproduction or vegetative reproduction. So you might have your original uh, Johnson grass or your original um, clump of quack grass, and then you see in the next season another one that is maybe half a meter away. That most probably is still going to be the same part of the original parent, which would then be called a ramet. What are some ways you guys know 
of how plants can reproduce vegetatively. What are some different types of vegetative reproduction besides the ones that I listed up there? <laughs> or you can read those off of the list. <laughs> All right, so we have basically stems and we have modified roots. Some modified stems include rhizomes, stolons, tubers, bulbs, and corums. Which plants have we seen so far that already have rhizomes as their main mechanism of reproduction? <coughs> Megan. Uh huh, Phragmites, good, good one. Ben, uh, Josh, tall fescue, yep. Ben, crackgrass, yeah. Johnson grass as well. Yep. Okay, which plants have we seen so far that have um, reproduced by stolons or horizontal stems that are above the surface or at the soil surface besides ground ivy and Bermuda grass? Milkweed is one of them. Yep. And we also had um, hemp dogbane, which also reproduces by stolons. Large crabgrass, yes, kind of, yeah. Okay, so some tubers. What are some weeds that we know that reproduce by tubers or producing tubers? Yellow nut sedge. Yellow nut sedge, yep. And all the nut sedges are pretty popular when reproducing by tubers. We also have some bulbs. Um, my favorites are some tulips, although they aren't weeds. Um, and then by corums as well, which is a swollen stem base at the bottom of the plant. We also have modified roots. So you have the rootstock, which is really common in dandelions, really problematic in landscapes, of course. And then we also have some creeping roots. What are some examples of creeping roots besides Canada thistle and field bindweed? And Josh, don't read off of the list. <laughs> the I think so. Mm hmm Yep. I'm pretty sure morning glory would also be an example of one. Yep, so all of the morning glories or, um, yeah, the true morning glories as we were talking about with Tony. Yeah, I think Japanese stillgrass, it's an annual, but it acts like a creeping root. So it's going to have that, um, very creepy and not creepy isn't scary, but like a creeping nature where it's going to um, cover a very wide area very quickly. But since it's a perennial, it's going to die off. Vegetative reproduction, mainly we're looking at either biennials or perennial plants. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not really too sure. I think that that would just be considered, um, oh gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue right now. But it basically that would just be r like root noting or node rooting. Um, you, you can have auxiliary roots, but those are basically ones that just come straight from the stem and it normally happens in um, more erect plants. But you know what, I'm going to check on that because I almost think that there is another term besides stolons for say if you have, um, especially with like, you know, like what large crabgrass or with Bermuda grass when the plant the stems kind of fall to the ground and then if a node starts to root, it can, you know, keep that creeping growth. I'll look on that for you guys for sure. Okay. So we're going to look into some examples here just looking physically at them. We've got some Bermuda grass, so here producing mainly by stolons and by rhizomes. Um, I had never seen Bermuda grass until I went down to Delaware this past summer when we had the weed, um, weed contest. It's pretty nasty. It covers really a big fan of sandy areas and will cover an entire beach like very, very quickly and it can all be just one plant. You start pulling it up kind of like um, large crab grass and you'll realize that you keep pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling and you're not getting to an end of a plant anytime soon. What? It would prevent erosion, but some people just don't like that because they want their sand. They want, you know, just for the sand. It's a weed, so it's one of those things where it's, it's helpful in preventing erosion, but it also is getting rid of like natural species that they want to have on the beach and maintain on the beach. 
All right, so Johnson Grass, as we know, produces by rhizomes. Wild onion is all other onions produced mainly by bulbs. We have bulbous buttercup is one of our corms. We have crabgrass, as we know, by rhizomes. Purple nut sedge, yellow nut sedge, all the nut sedges are by tubers. And dicorda is by stolons also. Here we have some more examples of Bermuda grass reproducing both by the rhizomes, its stolons on the surface, and then by seed. So red sorrel produces mainly by its roots, whereas leafy spurge is also by roots. Canada thistle, creeping root system. Here you can see in this example of, of Canada thistle, this is all just one plant, where here you have the horizontal root system at the bottom, which is giving rise to new plants over here, but all part of the same gamut. Okay, so um, how many of you guys say in your fields or research plots, have you seen weeds that reproduce vegetatively that have become like really problematic? Say, Megan. Yeah, that can be a really big problem. Um, anything else have you guys seen, say, Ben? Well, I've, I've worked in natural areas a lot. Uh-huh. Purple wheatgrass has an incredible capacity with vegetative driven populations. Yeah, it's real. they seem to have it like under control now, I feel, though. And weren't we saying earlier that like Phragmites is becoming the new, yeah. the new purple loosestrife? Well, well. Yeah. Anybody else have? Anecdotal evidence of this cool stuff. Okay. Yeah. Biocontrol, I think, is normally like the safest way. Um, I, I'm pretty sure in the past they use or tried to use a lot of chemicals, but that then they were realizing pretty bad idea. Yeah. I have a friend of mine. She's looking right now at um, the different effects of. Um, using biocontrol and then also using non-systemic herbicides in wetland areas and how that's having an effect on the frog species in the area. So looking at that whole kind of ecosystem effects of controlling for an invasive weed and seeing how that is affecting the ecosystem in the end. So, okay, so some advantages of vegetative um, reproduction. Why do you guys think that weeds might use vegetative reproduction instead of seed production? What did you say? <coughs> Could be less energy intensive. Yeah, you can, you know. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, you don't have to have that immediate. You don't need to spend so much time and resources into getting a, rep you know, vegetative growth and then waiting and then having your reproductive growth to produce those seeds. Rob. Mm hmm. Yeah, a lot of. Yeah, exactly. Like if a lot of vegetative um, propagated, you know, weeds really enjoy those, um, you know, naturally disturbed, disturbed areas or, you know, areas where there's been mechanical disturbance because it really helps with getting those um, reproductive structures, so stolons or rhizomes out into new areas. Yeah. Can be more effective. Yeah, exactly. So um, some factors that are really um, really have an effect on the success, though, of vegetative reproduction, vary with the age. If your seedling or if your plant is pretty new, might not be all that successful. On um, your plant density as well, um, you want to increase your, or having an increase in density, so having too many plants in an area might trigger um, sexual reproduction, so it might cause your perennial to actually go and bolt. Um, light quality and light availability can also be a factor. If you don't have too much or you don't have enough, you might not be able to make those resources through photosynthesis to create really um, large tubers or effective stolons. Um, and nutrition is always a problem or an, always an issue that you need to be concerned with. So is there enough nitrogen in your system or is there enough of other nutrients that you need in your soil to truly be effective? <laughs> Here, this figure is looking at the um, effect of the size of rhizomes on the sections and then looking at the depth at which they were planted at and seeing how successful these plants were 
at um, emergence or shoot emergence within the next year. So they planted them at several different um, depths in, within the soil. And then they also took different sizes of rhizome sections um, from the quackgrass. So the black bars representing 2.5, the clear bars are 15.5 centimeters or 15.2, and then the dashed bars are 30.5. So it um, seemed as if there was the most success in next year emergence occurred at sh pretty shallow depths within the soil, so 2.5 and 5 centimeters in the depth, not really all that deep. Whereas when you went deeper into the soil at 10 and 15 centimeters, the success of those rhizomes to gather nutrients, to have enough lightability to um, emerge within the next year was much, um, much less successful. Okay. Again, looking at then the tubers with yellow nut sedge, same similar sort of experiment, but just um, using you know, a single size tuber and planting it then at different depths. It seemed to be happiest when it was planted at about 10 centimeters. So this is also getting at recognizing that different species have different optimum depths of burial for their seeds and for their rhizomes, which we kind of talked about on Tuesday. And then this also is kind of looking at um, whether seed production ends up being um, successful or if it ends up being even helpful in the end for many of these perennial species. As you can see, oh wait, sorry. Um, pretty much it looks like, oops, I'm gonna here. Um, most important for plants that, it, um, or most of these plants, it's really important to grow vegetatively. Whereas, um, or at least the most effective um, means for these plants seem to be creeping rootstock and as well as rhizomes. For the least important plants that really don't need to have seeds are those that are using things like tubers and um, stolons and bulbs. Why do you guys think that might be? Why do you guys think that plants that are reproducing vegetatively through tubers and stolons don't need to use seed? whereas plants that use rhizomes and creeping rootstock might want to use seed. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times, too, animals might dig up the tubers and they can disperse them into new areas. Much more successful at like bringing plants into different areas and they have all that readily available you know, energy and sources that are you know, available to them. Whereas when you're looking at creeping rootstocks or rhizomes, not really all that helpful. You want to have that other um, example of sexual reproduction so you can still have you know, viable plants going up. Okay, so some disadvantages of vegetative propagation. Let me go back. What do you guys think are some disadvantages? Why would maybe you not want to use vegetative? Yeah, Ben. Yep, exactly. Yeah, you, this can get to be a problem with, say, um, catastrophic events or, say, diseases. If you have a whole field that is all just one plant and, say, part of it gets infected by a disease, you could end up then losing your entire crop if you're using, you know, say, bulbs or something like that. Um, another disadvantage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so issues of density, that can be a really big problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so yeah, susceptible to continued cultivation can be problematic. Um, it's less effective at dispersal. Um, you have, as Ben was saying, a less genetic vari um, variability and less plasticity within your plants. And over the long term, this can also be problematic because you don't really have that uh, genetic um, variation. You don't really have that area, spatial area, to really allow you to um, reproduce or really to evolve and become, you know, adapt to your environment and stuff like that. So I talk really fast, and that's the end of our lecture. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay, great. You